Well, welcome. My name is Jody Hickerson, and I'm here with two guys I greatly admire, um, David Kinnaman and George Barna, um, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Barna Group, which is amazing, um, 30 years. 30 years is a long time. Um, and so we're just going to talk about what this uh, meaningful work has been over the last 30 years. So George, I'm going to ask you to take us all the way back to the beginning with you and Nancy um, starting the Barna Group. and. Um, what was the motivation behind that? How did it get started? The, the why behind um, starting the Barna Group? Uh, I've been working in marketing research for a while and eventually realized that there wasn't any organization that was committed to providing insightful research for churches and other ministries around the country. So we, my wife and I prayed about it and thought it through and believe that maybe God was calling us to do such a work. So we moved back to California and started up what then was the Barna Research Group back in 1984. And uh, it, very modest and humble beginnings. I was in the spare bedroom of our house in Hollywood and uh, had a little Commodore 64 computer, which is about this big and about this powerful. And um, just waited for the phone to ring. You know, not, not exactly the world's greatest marketer, but uh, the Lord got things off the ground. Um, actually, Disney became our, our primary client for the first seven years we were in existence. And the neat thing about that was not only did I learn a lot from working with Disney and working for them, but the money that we made off Disney allowed us to put that profit back into the company so that we could do studies and give them to churches. Because at that point, there was no church in the country that was thinking, gee, I need data. Uh, I'm not sure there are that many today, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, we were starting out at ground zero. So it, it was really a great thing. God orchestrated everything in terms of the, the contacts that we were able to make, the things we were able to learn, the kind of services we were able to provide, the way we were able to build up the company in terms of the field work, the tabulation work, um, all those things. So it was, it was pretty amazing what God did. It was far beyond anything I had imagined. So starting something I mean many of us know that's not easy I mean the spare bedroom you weren't sleeping in the spare bedroom though right you were just working from the spare as bedroom. Long as, as long as I brought in work she let me sleep in the other okay, bedroom. Good. Yeah. That's good. Um, but you know that's it's difficult to start anything and so I'm sure there were many obstacles and things that were hard so what was the what was the motivation that like made you just keep keep at it like what was the thing? Well. Uh, there were a couple. I mean, one was I wanted to be able to use my gifts to serve the body of Christ. And when you're a researcher, primarily, you know, someone who writes and speaks, but all around the research, it's kind of hard to figure out how do you do that. And so I, 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 I had that kind of drive and passion going. But also as I looked at the state of the church across the country based on the research that we were able to do, that kept that passion burning because I could see enormous potential that wasn't even being pursued, much less taken advantage of. So it was something that, that kept me going. I thought, gosh, there's so much room for growth, so much opportunity for churches to, to impact people's lives that in many ways they don't even see or understand. And so if we can bring this information to them in a way that they can get their mind around and, and that fits within the framework of their theology. You know, we're not trying to usurp God. We're not trying to overtake the Holy Spirit's role. You know, we're trying to just work within the framework that he's given us. If we could make that happen, the church would be so much better off. And so that, that really was what, what got me excited. Oh, that's cool. I love the just wanting to be helpful, you know, and serve the local church and serve God yeah. with what you got. I mean, it, it was clear this was not going to be a money-making, <laughs> <laughs> you know, deal because, you know, I, I looked at all my friends in the market research industry, you know, who are working with the big corporations and, and whatnot, and, and they were all doing really well. And then I looked at, okay, churches, what is the average church budget for research? Hmm, mm, zippity-doo-dah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, it was really an uphill climb, but, I mean, God was faithful the whole way through. No, no complaints. Did you ever imagine in early days like fast forwarding 30 years, Barna Group being what it is today? Uh, n no, and I'm not sure what it is today. <laughs> <laughs> you can fill us in on that. But um, really, I, I, I'm, 
more of a guy that focuses on what's going on right now and what does that directly lead to. Now, I think we built the company around a vision that the Lord gave us for what we should be and how we should do it. But in terms of looking down the road 30 years and saying, oh, I want to have 200 employees, I want to have three buildings and four locations and you know, uh, annual revenues of $50 million, no, uh, that, that, that's, that's not how I think. I was more excited about the possibility of what kind of data could we actually provide to the church if we built this process today and then kept building on that over the course of time. Maybe 20 years down the line we could have XYZ tracking studies where we could tell them, look, here's what's been happening for the last 20 years. We can show you what approaches are making a positive difference, what approaches aren't working because we've got all this information that's coming from different angles, different approaches. That to me is, is exciting and, and useful. But the whole thing about, you know, gee, will we be the biggest you know, Christian market research company in the country wasn't really a consideration. You thought you were the only. Well, for a long time we yeah, were, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A pioneer. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a leadership principle just in terms of like doing, you know, what you felt was right in front of you to be helpful and valuable. Um, and I know you don't want to take credit for things like this, but 30 years, are there, those of us who are in leadership of different kinds, are is there you know, leadership principles, decisions that you made, um, you know, that continued this work for so long in this way, um, decisions that you made along the way for effective leadership of this company? Well, I think certainly one of them, and, and David is a part of this, was uh, waiting to know God's vision for this entity. Most of the leaders that I know come up with their own vision and I think that's why ultimately their stuff falls apart. Because if it's not from God, he has no obligation to bless it. But if it's his vision, and I'm simply trying to honor him by making it happen the best I can with the gifts and resources he's entrusted to me, that's a whole different ball game. Then, it, then it's really in his lap. And I'm just trying to take my cues from him. And so for, for us, I think one of the key elements was what's God's vision for this thing? Either he wants it or he doesn't. If he doesn't, then we're all fooling ourselves. If he does, then I've got to be true to that. And so I think for you know the 30 years we've been around, uh, that vision has been the heartbeat of what we're about. And, and then in addition to that, again, you know, thinking about David and, and the critical role he's played in the company for so long, two decades. I, I think that as leaders, it's, it's important to know the vision, to figure out, so what's the strategy that gets us to pursue that vision effectively? And then to find people who are willing to own that vision and who have great skills and passion for it. And give them the assignment, give them, give them the lay of the land and get out of their way. You know, I, I, I think I might be the last person on earth who will ever be called a micromanager. Um, you know, I, I mean, they don't even know that I work there half the time, you know. So uh, the key thing, I think, is find great people and turn them loose. And, you know, David's a great example of that, of somebody who, who came in and really got it and ran with it and, you know, ran past me, and, and that was great. You always want people to, to be doing better stuff than you can do because it's a team effort. It's not about you. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, tell us, how, how did you come to Barna Group? How did you get started? I mean, two decades for yourself, but how did you start? Yeah, Barna? Back, back in 95, so it's coming on two decades. It's crazy. Um, well, actually, I uh, expected to be a pastor. Uh, so my dad's a lifelong pastor of a church in Phoenix and uh, read one of George Barna's books in a school, in a school class in college. Uh, and so I um, actually called the company to see if I could intern, and Nancy Barna talked me into a, a pretty crappy job, actually, <laughs> making eight bucks an hour, <laughs> running the phone Go center. Running the phone center. Uh, but I still remember, I don't know if you know this, but there was a, a lunch we had when I was first interviewing for the job when, when Nancy said something like, you know, I think someday George would be interested in, like, you know, giving this company to somebody, mm -hmm. like letting somebody run past it. And, and, you know, it was an interesting conversation because, you know, she must have had something intuitive mm -hmm. about maybe my own call. I, I don't know. But it was something that, that actually, I, I never expected to, to stick around for two decades, right? But I, as George sort of said, like I, I have continually found my own calling 
in the context of this larger vision to, to try to help the church understand culture and culture to understand what's happening within faith. And so for me, it's been kind of a cool fulfillment of what God has called me to do. I was one of the only psychology major students who was interested in statistics. Um, I love social psychology and group, you know, group psychology. So I was a nerd, and and so being, you know, being able to do that through Barna was super, super interesting. And you know, kind of one thing led to another. Starting out as a running the phone center, you know, being a research director, being a vice president, being a president, you know, now owning the business and and you know, purchasing it from George now five years ago. Um, so it's been. Um, it's been an interesting journey for sure. So leading Barna Group now, what are, what are you focusing on now? What are you guys up to now? Well, a lot of the same things, you know, trying to use information. Um, it's a different kind of world because information is more commoditized. There's many more people doing surveys, um, a lot of free stuff that's available instantaneously through the internet. So I mean, it's hard to run a, a for-profit business in that space. Um, you know, even though there are more churches that have a budget for research, um, you know, they think they can do it themselves a lot of times. Um, and so it's, and, and they should, right? Like I'm, I'm all for people being good information consumers. Um, but, but we're doing a lot of the same things, trying to understand culture, trying to understand how faith and culture mix, trying to track public opinion, uh, all sorts of different trends. We're focusing a lot on millennials and their perceptions of church and how the church can deal with this very different generation, 16 to 30 uh, today. Um, we're, we're looking at you know uh, how the church can um, be bold in a, a culture that seems to steamroll our convictions. Uh, so there's a lot of new stuff that we're working on in relation to that. Um, but you know, trying to be this courageous, you know, Sounds easy. company. Yeah, well, Sounds really like easy you stuff you're going after now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me ask you. We can, can promise you, you good hours. Uh, no, <laughs> Eight dollars no an hour at the, yeah. at the phone yeah. center. Yeah. I, got, I hear you. Um, so as far as, I mean, you talked a little bit about just leadership and things. Are there stories that you guys have even just from what you've learned from each other as far as leadership and how you've seen him lead and, and how you've experienced his leadership, um, things that would be helpful for well, yeah, I'd be happy to start. One of the one of the, my earliest memories uh, was doing uh, George was traveling, and so there was a media call that was going to be with Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade, uh, Stephen Arterburn, uh, uh, who's you know a famous uh, you know counselor, and um, and so George was like, hey, why don't you do this media call with these guys? And I was like, I've only been here like a, you know a year at the time, I think, but it felt to me like I was it was way underqualified. And for you were it. what, like 23 or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we get on this media call, and there's all these ma you know sort of national mainstream media, USA Today, the big news magazines, you know, some Christian media and, and the like. And so Bill Bright goes first and talks about you know, man, revival's happening in America. I can see it. I can sense it. And uh, you know he, he such a great man of God just talks about all of his vision for the way the Lord was working, and so then the media someone from the media uh, asks uh, so the, the guy from Barna uh, what do you think about that did the stats back any of this up <laughs> so um, well I had to, I had to be honest well you know no not really but it, it looks you know here's some things that were you know positive trends here's some negative trends um, but one of the things I learned from that was you know allowing people to go out and mm -hmm. and you know we yeah already I had already done a lot of research and 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 work on this I knew I knew my stuff uh, and so and he was he was George was like I don't need the credit for it so it was an amazing experience for me even though I had to kind of contradict you know Bill Bright in that instance but I also learned you have to be honest you have to you know say what the data are telling you you can't you know you can't just help a guy out you know because yeah. he's he's gone out on a limb and talked about revival sweeping America um, so it's been an interesting journey, you know, trying to trying to learn how to honor, you know, a guy like Dr. Yeah. Bright, but also say, oh, here's what the data is telling us. And, and so. I think that's an important point because so much of what we do is to contradict the prevailing wisdom. Mm. People don't tend to look to data to confirm what they feel, think, or want to see. Yeah. They just run with it. It's, well, I, I, I think, I feel... And, and our job is to either back that up with data and say, you're absolutely right, or to show them what the data actually shows and say, you know, that you may feel that way, but that's not how reality is. It's more and more difficult in our culture these days because the media is what defines our reality for us. Mm -hmm. And the media are not values free. They're coming into it with a perspective that they're trying to push. So we're trying to come into it 
I mean, the, the, the reason that we exist is to try to convey truth as best and objectively as we can determine it to be, whether we like it or not, this is what the data seem to say. And, and a lot of times that gets you into hot water. I, I don't know about you, I'm sure it's the same way, but I mean, I've lost a lot of friends over the years mm -hmm. who run ministries, uh, you know, who are in government, you know, uh, corporate executives who can't stand the fact that I'm not gonna back up their lies mm -hmm. You know, but that I, I have to say, well, that's not really the way we see it. Here's what the data show. Doesn't always make you the most popular guy at the party, but you know, if you want to be popular, this isn't what you do. One of the things I've noticed is that people will love our research when it confirms the things that they think about the world, mm -hmm. and then as soon as there's something that sort of doesn't match what they believe, they question the methodology, right? Mm -hmm. So if they believe it, we could have interviewed two people and they'd be happy, <laughs> right? Like, well, that's a fact from Barna. In fact, often we find that people make up statistics or, or they'll quote us for things that, that is not our, it's not our research, right? We get a lot of credit for things that actually aren't ours, uh, which is hard because we're sometimes trying to, you know, correct the misperceptions about our own data. Um, but it's interesting sort of the psychology of what it is that we believe and why we believe it. In fact, one of the things we've been trying to do in the last five years since I've been running the business is put more emphasis and budget on design because we know that people don't believe things that don't look mm. like they've actually been yeah. cra you know, crafted. So we've worked hard in some of our products and such to you know, put infographics and to you know, really make an effort at some of the design. It's one of the things that we've, you know, we find with millennial Christians, like if it looks good, they believe it. Mm. Now we're not trying to make bad stuff look good, but we're trying to say if you're gonna if you're gonna wrestle with the implications of our data, we want to spend money on design to make we sure you look can, at it. Yeah, so yeah. you can you can actually you know wrestle with it and and not dismiss it out of hand. And I think one of the things that he's alluding to is a a major reason why I thought it was time for me to get out of the company and let him run it, and, and that's that there's this generational shift that's taken place in America. I relate well to boomers. I mean, they don't always like what I say or how I say it, but I mean, we speak the same language, we've had a lot of the same experiences, that works, it's comfortable. But pastors and other ministry leaders who are in their 20s and 30s, maybe early 40s, don't necessarily relate very well to me. And so we were getting to a point where I noticed as I was out speaking or in different correspondence with people, that younger pastors didn't get me, and I didn't get them. And so it, it became clear, look, if, if, if I want the company, based on the vision that God gave us, to keep going, I'm gonna have to find somebody who relates to that culture. And David's great at that, and so it made all the sense in the world to say, here, it's your problem now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Most I could do. Uh, but, but I mean, it, it's, it's been a great thing because even the kinds of things he's talking about, like design, he will tell you, you know, if we get really honest, that for years he would say, you know, gee, maybe, maybe we could do some more graphics on this, don't you think? It's like, I don't have time for graphics, okay? This is the data, let them deal with it, you know? And, and you know, he'd say, well, I think maybe they get it if we, if we gave them some pictures, you know? And it's like, uh, Now you can do it. I had to learn desktop publishing just because we had no budget for it. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, okay, so being, honest as you're saying which is not always the most popular I would love to know um, you know you've got so much experience here not to pull from everything that you've ever learned but current state of the church what is maybe one thing that's like encouraging that you see and um, one thing that's concerning that maybe you see right now with the, with the church well I'm concerned I mean this is part of the reason why I'm uh, passionate about the work of Barna Group. Um, I feel like I'm a steward of this brand. I get to stand on the shoulders of George and Nancy Barna and all the great work he's done. He's written 50 plus books and I've written two. Something yeah. like that. What yeah. you we were, we're, 50 something. <laughs> uh, but to stand on the shoulders of that and then to keep it, keep it rolling, I'm concerned about how it is that church leaders, especially younger church leaders, deal with reality. Uh, one of our mantras is that the first job of a leader is to accurately describe reality. This is a, a phrase from Max Dupree. So you have, to, you have to describe reality well. And so for instance, you know, the, the size of the Hispanic community is gonna double in the next 30 years from 17% of the population to 29%. And when we released a big study about Hispanics in America, it was the, the, the worst selling product we've ever had, right? And so 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm, it's just my own, my own, you know, kind of noticing this that you know, if we don't, if we don't understand what's driving Hispanic Christians in America, most of whom are Catholic but not exclusively, we, we won't be able to deal with this, right? Like, demographics are destiny, and we have to pay attention to that. So that's that's a concern that I have um, is how well we will use information, use good wisdom, good discernment uh, to make sense of our opportunities as leaders. Um, uh, but but I'm, I'm I'm still very hopeful about that because I see great leaders uh, who are trying to, to who are trying to wrestle with this who are who are trying to get their arms around what's happening in our culture um, you know uh, various church you know pastors and different kind of models of church so it's been it's kind of this it's a it's a it's a real hard balance right like I'm I'm at sometimes very discouraged but at other times very hopeful um, and I try to I try to keep keep moving actually it's um, it's harder than it looks, you know. Five years into owning the business, it's like, mm -hmm. ah, this is this is why, uh, this is why it's so hard, you know. And and I, I come to places where I'm like, okay, this is why George did it this way, you know. I I couldn't have imagined this is why we have a policy about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I've learned a lot of things, and and um, and I, I'm very hopeful about where the church can go, actually, based on you know some of the things that we're learning. Cool. What about you? Well. I mean, odd as it may sound, I think one of the more encouraging things is when you look at, you know, what's being called the rise of the nuns and, uh, you know, the, the spiritual but not religious movement, you know, all these kinds of things that are reshaping the way that we have to approach faith in America. I think those are really healthy for us. Now, I know it, it's not resulting in booming church attendance yet. I think if we lead intelligently and strategically it could because these are individuals that are asking questions that need to be asked they're not just being hidden or ignored they're real deep significant kinds of things that they're wrestling with and it's exactly the kind of stuff that the Christian church ought to be helping people with so if if we can get on board with that and say this is a phenomenal opportunity I think then that the greatest days of the church at large are in front of us. Now on the other hand, why aren't more of those people who are asking those questions and looking for those answers gravitating toward the Christian church which has the answers? Well, it's because our people don't know the answers and our people aren't living the answers. And so when these folks on the outside are looking in, one of the things they're trying to figure out is where's the consistency between what they allegedly believe and how I see them live. And so we, we've, we've got to blend those things together better. You know, one of the things that we've always been big on is trying to help churches facilitate transformation in people's lives, because that's the bottom line on all this. We could talk a long time about that. But, you know, one aspect of that is having a biblical worldview and looking at the fact that you know about one out of every 20 Christians has a biblical worldview, uh, that, that speaks volumes to where the church is at and where it's going to be unless those of us in leadership positions make some radical changes in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Well, one of the things I respect the most, I know, you know, 50 some odd books and tons of influence and um, is that you guys, I know you both live it out, you know, what you believe in the way that you live in this community. And so I'm super grateful, not only for the work that you do, but for who you are and who your families are. So um, thank you and happy 30th anniversary to Barna Group. We're still standing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you guys.